So this video is going to go over the slides that are in front of and after all the antibiotic slides because we already made uh, videos and charts about those. So really quickly, kind of a history of antimicrobials. Um, Alexander Fleming and two of his colleagues were the ones to discover penicillin. So remember, he, um, Fleming was studying bacteria and he went away on vacation and when he came back there was fungus on his plates but rather than trashing them he looked at them and studied them and realized that some of the bacteria did not grow right up against the fungus it looked like the fungus was somehow preventing or inhibiting bacterial growth and so him and his two colleagues um, started studying the kind of the details of penicillin and what it could target against and how it was working. And so the, the first antibiotic and the most widely used antibiotic for a long time was penicillin. So Paul Ehrlich did, came up with this theory of selective toxicity. And what that means is we need an antimicrobial to be selectively toxic. We want it to harm the pathogen, but not harm the host. And so um, he, him and his lab set about screening hundreds and hundreds of, of compounds to try and find one that would kill the pathogen, but not harm the host. And they found what they termed the magic bullet, um, also known as compound 606. And it specifically targeted the causative agent of syphilis, which is trypanema pallidum. And so the methods that he used are, are still in play today to try and um, develop and identify antimicrobials that can be effective at eliminating pathogens while doing as minimal damage as possible to the host. So when we're thinking about antimicrobials, there's a few things you have to consider when you're selecting an antimicrobial. So for instance, what is the target organism? So antibiotics are used to treat bacteria. If you have a viral infection, you cannot use antibiotics. They do not work. So we have antibiotics for bacteria, antifungals for a fungal infection, and antivirals for a viral infection. Um, but antivirals aren't quite as common as antibiotics and antifungals. You can also consider the nature of the antibiotic. So bacteria static agents are just going to prevent microbial growth from occurring. It doesn't actually kill the organisms, but it prevents them from replicating, so they cannot spread. Bactericidal agents actually kill existing bacteria. The last thing you really want to consider is the spectrum of activity. So some antibiotics have a narrow spectrum. That means they're designed to target very specific organisms. So, for instance, the kind of burgundy bar at the top, isoniazid, is specific for mycobacterium tuberculosis. Okay, so, if you have a strep, you know, strep infection, maybe strep throat, or if you have a staph infection, you're not going to take isoniazid. It has a very narrow spectrum of activity. It is only for mycobacterium tuberculosis. But if you look at the red bar, that's tetracycline, notice that it can um, target gram positives and gram negative bacteria, and then two classes of bacteria that have just very unique life cycles that are a little bit harder to treat. Those are the chlamydias and the rickettsias. Now, you don't have to memorize each of these um, bacteria, but just know that those antibiotics that target very specific organisms have a narrow spectrum, whereas broad spectrum means it will be able to either inhibit or kill um, a lot of different organisms. Okay, so now I am going to just quickly review um, what antimicrobials target. And you don't have to memorize the details on this slide, but notice that antimicrobials are targeting two key structures, the cell wall and the plasma membrane, and some key processes, DNA synthesis, aka DNA replication, and then transcription and translation. And a lot of times translation is targeted by inhibiting the ribosome in some way. But there are some key 
uh, metabolic pathways that are also going to be targeted. So folic acid is one that um, is common to a lot of bacteria. And then the mycolic acid pathway is strictly for mycobacterium. All right, I'm going to scroll down a lot through this because we've already talked about it. I apologize for all the scrolling. Hold on, I'm trying to get to where I need to be. Okay, so this last part kind of talks about um, why taking antibiotics when you shouldn't um, can be problematic. So remember, we have our normal microbiota that's in and on our body that helps us. It helps maintain certain environments in certain parts of our body, and it competes with pathogens for nutrition and resources and space and things like that. And so a lot of our normal microbiota are bacterial species. So they are also subject to be killed or inhibited by antibiotics. So let's say that a couple years ago, you, know, you had um, a sore throat and you got antibiotics to treat strep throat. But you started feeling really good before your prescription was done, right? So you still had a few antibiotic pills left. So you thought, I'm just gonna save these for a rainy day and not have to go to the doctor, not pay a copay. And so now, present day, your throat hurts and you're like, aha, I know what this is, it's strep throat. Let me start on these antibiotics that I already have. Well, maybe you don't have strep throat, right? And so now you're self-diagnosing and you're self-medicating. And what's actually going to happen is you're going to disrupt your normal microbiota. And sometimes that's a really big problem because, as you see in this picture, sometimes there are potential pathogens that are resistant to certain antibiotics. Okay, those would be the two blue squares. But they, their growth is going to be kept in check by all of the other bacterial species making up your normal microbiota. So they're not really a threat. But when you go and you take unnecessary um, antibiotics, you're going to kill your normal microbiota. So suddenly that balance is gone. And those antibiotic resistant bacteria are going to be able to grow and multiply, cause a super infection in your body, which can be really bad and uncomfortable. Um, but it can also then allow you to spread this now super bug, this antibiotic resistant bug to other people. Okay. And so it turns out that antibiotic development is dwindling and there's just so many um, super bugs these days that are resistant to um, antibiotics that we're having to try to develop new an improved way of targeting them. So there's different like bacteriophage that they're trying to manipulate to be able to target certain types of diseases. Um, and so we're kind of having to change our approach to targeting some of these superbugs. Okay. And so um, this again is just very similar to what I was already talking to you about, um, kind of how we are able to take antibiotics and wipe out our normal microbiota, allowing um, drug resistant bacteria to spread. And then they spread through the population, become more rampant, and before you know it, they're a really big problem. Um, a lot of the causative agents of sexually transmitted infections um, are now potential superbugs because so many people don't know that they have STIs, that they don't get treated for them, and so they continue to pass these bugs, microbes, onto other people. Well, the more they're able to replicate, the more hosts they find themselves in, the more mutations can occur, and the more likely they are to become drug resistant. Okay, and so there's a huge concern right now that the next set of superbugs are actually going to be those pathogens that cause STIs. Um, so how does antibiotic resistance come about? Well, some organisms are just naturally resistant to certain things. So if this is showing you the gram-negative cell wall, and I really want to talk about the porin, so what's circled in the middle. Remember, porins regulate what go in and out of a gram-negative cell. So unless an antibiotic is able to sneak its way through that porin, because it happens to have a shape similar to that of the porin, then nothing's going to work against the gram-negatives. They have to have a similar shape to get through that porin to then 
um, kill or inhibit the growth of a gram negative. Okay, so those porins give some give gram negative some intrinsic resistance. Otherwise, um, antibiotic resistance is typically acquired by mutations. Again, the more bacteria grow, the more likely there is to be a mutation that results in antibiotic resistance or through horizontal gene transfer. So from left to right, we have conjugation because there's that pillus that you see. We have transformation where the bacteria are taking up DNA from the environment. And then we have transduction on the right, which is where the bacteriophage um, is um, giving the host cell um, some bacterial DNA. All right, um, the last slide for this video is going to be mechanisms of resistance. So some bacteria um, have acquired or evolved, evolved to acquire efflux pumps, which pump things out of the cell. And so it turns out that if you try to treat certain bacterial species with an antibiotic, they will literally just shoot it back out of the cell. They're like, nope, not happening, not today. The antibiotic comes in and it's immediately kicked out. That's an efflux pump, it pumps things out. And you do not need to memorize um, which type of antibiotics we're known to have efflux pumps for. Just know what efflux pump and what it is. Um, the opposite is true too, just like we saw with porins. Um, there are structures that prevent the antibiotic or antimicrobial from even entering or penetrating into the cell. There, some organisms have enzymes whose sole purpose is to deactivate antibiotics. So with penicillin, because it was the most widely used antibiotic for a while, um, over time, certain bacterial species evolved to have the enzyme penicillinase. And the only thing penicillinase does is cleave that beta-lactam ring of penicillin. That's the region that makes penicillin effective. So by cleaving it or cutting it, that antibiotic no longer works. And there's also been evidence of target modification. So for instance, with the ribosome, because so many antibiotics target the ribosome, uh, scientists have found that the overall shape of the ribosome has gradually changed very little over time, but it's only changed in such a way that the antibiotic can no longer bind. The overall integrity and structure of the ribosome is similar enough that it can do its job, right? But it's changed just enough that the antibiotic is no longer effective against it. So that's what we mean by target modification. All right, y'all, that is going to be the end of this video.